Hello, everybody. Wait. Huh? Welcome to Theory Tuesday. Ha <laughs> ha. This is A W here with Hyperion. Uh, uh, what's your name? Uh, Josh Al. Josh Al. <laughs> and Kaya. Uh, Kaya. Uh, continuing uh, our reading of uh, the book on Deleuze, which is. Thinking the political Deleuze and the political emphasis on the end. And uh, last time we read the introduction, this time we're reading uh, the first chapter, which is chapter one, concept and image of thought, Deleuze's conception of philosophy. And uh, just to let you know, it seems most of this book, uh, at face value, would be like, what? W where are the politics and all of this? Because like, all the title chapters are literally just like these metaphysical concepts of Deleuze. Except for chapter 4 and 5. But uh, we'll see if we get there. Anyways, uh, this is supposed to be, uh, yeah, uh, sort of describing Deleuze's general philosophy, hopefully. And it actually may explain things to us. Uh, Although, uh, according to uh, Ego Waffles, uh, you know, he doesn't trust very many people to interpret Deleuze properly. I guess we share something in common in that we don't trust many people to just interpret our favorite philosophers that way. Yeah. But uh, it's okay. I acknowledge this is not Deleuze as such, so, you know, everything here is tentative. But most of us don't care anyway, so. Yeah. Did he recommend this one? No. Oh, okay. I was just so looking for something to lose in politics. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this came up. And I'm like, well, one one book is as good as another one. I don't know shit. So at, at worst, we can be lied to. At best, yeah. we can actually learn something. Maybe find an interest, even if it's wrong. Yeah. We could uh, take the... Same approach I take to Lacan, even if what he said is bullshit, it makes me think, and you know, at least something like comes Lacanians, out of it. Man. Like, there's this person <laughs> on Lefty Poll, like, somebody posted about me linking the uh, Left of Wreckage channel, like, the theory reading shit on, like, the one of the threads about yeah. reading theory or some shit and like some Lacanian dude, like, posted, like, something that's, like, I swear just, like, reads to me, like, babble about how like you know i'm I, he was implying i was like semi-dogmatic or something that you know that i don't recognize you know the uh, you know the, the whole lacanian thing about you know that this subject is like some sort of void of existence or whatever and i'm like uh, i don't mm -hmm. know what the fuck you're talking about god damn you rationalists <laughs> well They said like I hadn't read something that they once offered, like told me to read. I, I don't know what. I don't remember anybody recommending anything. Because if they had, I, I might have like you know looked it over and uh, given them some feedback of what I thought about it. At least, at least I would have looked over the summary overviews on like fucking Goodreads or something. <laughs> yeah. But I don't remember it, like that person ever. Uh, tell me to read anything. I remember like the Freud poster telling me to read shit and like I yeah. just outright told him I didn't care. But anyways, uh, we'll see, we'll see. Starting the chapter, let's get reading on this. For many critics, Deleuze and Guattari's political philosophy remains an enigma. I wish that we had like the little sounds like Ooh. You know, that little creepy sound thing from Halloween? Or every time, every, time, they, every time Enigma is like mentioned, that, that should play. <laughs> or every time they mention Enigma, uh, we take a shot of vodka or something. Oh, jeez. Uh, I don't or have no, booze. Like, what's a French? <laughs> a French no. wine? Yeah. Oh, well, my grandma really got, like, grandma's French got like some liquor. French wine, but uh, that's for Thanksgiving. Uh. I, yeah, I'm not like reading. I'm like not reading an enigma. <laughs> I'm I just don't like it because it seems like a cop out. Like, oh, it's just enigmatic. You don't understand it. 
it's too difficult. The worst thing is when like people like uh, attack Hegel for like being an enigma, unreadable, like and mystic, and I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, come on, just read the guy. <laughs> like, yeah, okay. Like at first, it's gonna be like, what the fuck is he saying? That's anyone but, though. Yeah, that's the way. You, anyone, can't, you can't expect uh, immediate gratification. You can't expect to understand everything the first time you read it, maybe. But but hey, was all about the method. He's, yeah, he's all about the method. But I mean, we must concede that the language he uses is unfamiliar to most people. It is. They're not. If taught. you presuppose, if you presuppose like the meanings, or if you think yeah. he's like meaning something like special about it, which he is, but he isn't. Which is exactly why it makes him like. <laughs> Like there could there there literally can be a common sense reading of Hegel, which would make a lot of sense, and would sound like utter nonsense. And it wouldn't be too far off, I think. The only thing would be just like having the right spin on it. But anyways, uh, oh, we're being autistic. Let's move on. Yeah. Their language is often unfamiliar, confronting the reader with an apparently endless series of new terms, plateaus, order words, segmentarity, becomings, and nomadic war machines, to mention only some of their neologisms. The difficulty of their thought is a result both of the proliferation of new concepts and of its form. A Thousand Plateaus is an avowedly experimental work which appears to lack coherent argument or structure of any kind. As the introduction suggests, suggests it is a rhizome or structure eh, sorry sorry about that as the introduction suggests it is a rhizome book which grows in all directions uh, which hopefully means? explains what like rhizome <laughs> is because i don't know because the only yeah. rhizomes i know are these things called like you know mush what are those mushrooms that grow underground called truffles yeah uh, that's, that's the only rhizomes i know and like maybe i think like okay. that applies to, like potatoes or something so we need a pig to find this out what rhizome is. Well, like the rhizome uh, grows horizontally, and um, yeah. they compare it to trees, which like have that hierarchical structure. And, oh. uh, yeah, it, it loses me very quickly. So uh, it's been a long time since I like rhizome, massive roots. Yeah. yeah, isn't it just like a bundle or mass of? Whatever, because that's what truffles are, that are yeah. just a bundle of, like, you know, these webs of, like, the cells of fungi. Yeah, yeah, pretty much, I think. Okay, he calls it an image of thought based on the botanical rhizome that apprehends multiplicity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's continue. Hopefully, like, this person uh, defines it. As the introduction suggests, uh, uh, sorry, where is there that? Its aim is not to represent the world, but through its specific form of conceptual deterritorialization to connect with movements of deterritorialization in other social assemblages. Hmm. All right, so it's it's not to capture. Uh, well, no, I mean, uh, they wouldn't be saying it in his way. It doesn't seem to be intended to capture truth in a regular uh, classical sense, so, I think. Because I've read a little bit about what like, Deleuze thinks truth is, and like, truth is like an event, and uh, it's not, you know, this correspondence of things. So it would be a truth, but it's not our typical notion of truth. Well, at least All a right. thousand plateaus is making sense now, why it's called that. The concept of assemblage provides a kind of formal continu continuity to the book to the extent that the successive plateaus both define and describe a series of assemblages, machinic assemblages of desire, collective assemblages, assemblages of enunciation, territorial assemblages, and so on. The series is open-ended. In each plateau, specific concepts are proposed in order to analyze the relevant content, language, desire, music, the social field, in terms of the assemblages which inhabit that field. While there is a degree of continuity across the different plateaus, there is also continuous conceptual variation. Concepts recur, or would we say they repeat? But always in different relations to other concepts, such that their identity in turn is transformed. The book itself is a particular kind of assemblage of concepts and conceptual plateaus.
Uh, so, like, part of me wants to understand this as, like, plateaus are actually... Plateaus in the fields are actually, like, basically, like, ontological levels, but, uh, I doubt that's the case. Continuing, yet Deleuze has always regarded his work with Guattari as philosophy in a very traditional sense of the word. If philosophy is what Felix and I try to produce in Anti-Oedipus and A Thousand Plateaus, especially in A Thousand Plateaus, which is a long book putting forward many concepts. The best concepts, the most beautiful concepts. You've never seen any concepts this good. <laughs> Let's make philosophy great again. Okay. <laughs> In order to reconcile such description with the unorthodox content and style of his work, it is helpful, helpful to turn to that conception of philosophy outlined by Deleuze and Guattari in What is Philosophy? At first glance, their definition of philosophy as the creation of concepts is uncontroversial. Political philosophy provides many examples of conceptual invention, from Plato's Republic to modern concepts of civil, liberal, and democratic society. However, Deleuze and Guattari's conception of philosophy appears much less traditional once we understand what they mean by concept and what they consider to be the task of philosophy. They propose a construct constructivist conception of the form of philosophy, agreeing with Nietzsche that philosophers must no longer accept concept as a gift, nor merely purify and polish them, but first make and create them, present them, and make them convincing. They also agree with Nietzsche that the creation of new concepts is an inherently political activity. Its goal should be not just the recognition of existing states of affairs or the justification of existing opinions and forms of life, but the absolute de deterritorialization of the present in thought. For this reason, they described it as an untimely mode of thinking that calls for a new earth, a new people. So, I mean, I'm not going to hide my complete disagreements with Nietzsche and his approaches to philosophy. I mean, as much as... Uh, I sort of like the idea of the Ubermensch. I don't believe philosophy falls under what the Ubermensch like ends up doing. It's, sorry, philosophy isn't just whatever bullshit you cook up and you can convince people. That's what those bastards we know as the sophists <laughs> would say. Yeah. So wait, um, I'm not sure if I'm reading this incorrectly, but the vibe I'm getting from this is that they have a political goal already and they just base their philosophy around that they create concepts around their political goal they already have uh yeah or you just make it up i mean maybe you just have some wacky trip like meditating or doing drugs and uh you're like wow man uh, like you know everything's different and then you start like <laughs> you start thinking about everything that way and you make this whole you know uh, disjointed philosophy and you're like it's expressing your creativity and you try to convince people that it's true and maybe some people like buy into it uh, but um, <laughs> my point then is like, who cares? Like, I mean, I certainly wouldn't care. I suppose uh, as plenty of people care. I mean, like, there's like the object-oriented ontologists, which basically do the same thing. Like, they're like, well, you know, we're gonna try to, we're just gonna be creative and like try to think objects in and of them, in and for themselves or something. And uh, they also do this kind of thing. Like, their concepts are very weird. Uh, you know, they use new words. Uh, uh, they they bring in more new relations, but at the same time, the the new relations aren't really new relations, in my opinion. At least when I look at the uh, the general outline of Deleuze, as far as I know, and I, let me I admit here, I know very little. It just seems to me like a whole lot of old stuff with a new coat of paint. You know, it's a dog. It's just a shaggier dog, and it has sunglasses <laughs> and a little ponytail. <laughs> Like that that's how Deleuze feels to me. Like what what do you see in him that you think is just like a rehatching of very old philosophical ideas? Um, a repetition? Oh. <laughs> like, well, I mean, no, like no, I'm not saying like he's just like a, a he's like got nothing new. I mean, his emphasis is new. Like no, I don't think anybody really had like this emphasis on like what if we just like start with difference instead of identity? Uh, before that, you had, you know, uh, you had pluralists and everything, but nobody had, like, a concept, like, of trying to get this to absolute plurality, like, as such, multiplicity as such, difference as such. Uh, so that's kind of his originality, you know, he he seems to be really be uh, 
the first one to just go all out with this full conceptualization of everything in, in that mode. But the way I see it is, it's not really new in that other people have considered a lot of what he says, not in the way he says it, but it's still accounting for things that he accounts for. And he himself becomes blind to the very things that are implicated in what he says, you know, in which, like, once you start talking about difference and you start talking about the virtual and, like, it's just a, you know, there's pure differences as such that exist there, you know, nothing is identical or even self-identical. And, well, in order to have that very thing, you have to be talking about things that could be identical and not self-identical, you know, at any given point. And, you know, to talk about differences already requires talking about identity, and that's where I think Deleuze as interesting as he is, just uh, you know, just doesn't go far enough into the the very logic of what he needs. Admittedly, uh, he he's not interested in logic as such. Like he's he's more he has an aesthetic bent. So you know, he's trying to talk about differences. Um, not that he's like an empiricist, because he's not an empiricist like Hume. He's not going off of the senses. He's trying to be a so-called transcendental empiricist, which I'm still not sure what that means. But basically, I mean, like, eh, my my suspicion is that uh, Deleuze cheats. It is uh, basically it. Uh, conceptually, he cheats, even though he, he will deny it, and Deleuzians will deny it. They're like, well, we're not trying to be like Hegelians, like have this intelligible conceptuality. Um, in which case, it's a cheat, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, not to lay judgment on Deleuze uh, as such, you know. It's just my ignorant opinions here, people. Uh, don't take my word for it. Go ahead and read it yourself. If you find it interesting, uh, knock yourself out. Yeah. So, continuing. Deleuzean concept has open multiplicities. Deleuze and Guattari conceive a concept as complex acts which take the form of singularities in thought. The concept as a specifically philosophical creation is always a singularity. As a complex singularity, every concept has components that may in turn be considered as concepts. There are no concepts with only one component. To take an example from the history of political philosophy, Hobbes' concept of the social contract has a number of, number of component concepts, each with its own history and internal complexity. These include the state of nature, the restless desire for power, the natural laws of human reason, and the artificial person or, or leviathan, which results from the compact. A change in one or more of these elements changes the concept of the contract. For example, in contrast to Hobbes, Locke characterizes the parties to the contract not as subject to a relentless will to power without moral obligations toward one another, but as property owners subject to obligations toward themselves and others derived from divine natural law. Another variation occurs in the shift from philosophers such as Hobbes and Rousseau, for whom the contract involves relinquishing power and authority to sovereign to those such as Locke and Nozick, for whom power is simply lent to a sovereign authority on condition that certain important needs are met. In each case, the outcome is a singular concept of a social contract where the nature of the singularity is determined by the components and the complex relations between them. So, um, not much that I disagree with here, actually. I mean, so, yeah. uh, of course, except, you know, um, the calling it an act, you know, complex acts seems strange. Uh, but the rest of that makes sense to me. I mean, con the whole point of concept is that they unite multiple things. You know, if you just have a concept of a single thing, you don't really have a concept. Yeah, I like how uh, they explained it very quickly. Because I was going to ask about the quote immediately of the Deleuze and Guattari quote, but whoever wrote this explained it extremely quickly and very clearly. So, I have to applaud them for that. So, let's continue. As acts of thought, concepts are intentional rather than extensional objects, as in the set theoretical model of concept as classes. Similarly, components of a concept are not like individual terms falling under a given concept. Rather, they are intensive elements, pure singularities, such as the individual subject in a state of nature, the subject of natural law, and so on. Uh, just to note, intensive here is... Uh, 
not about the the usual sense that we have. It literally is a very literal consideration of you yeah. know inwardness. It's like a it's not a thing applied outward, but a thing applied inward. It seems, or a thing that is conceived inward, not rather outwardly. It's not a the, the set theoretical model of concepts. You know, um, a set would be a concept, and a concept is whatever you know ends up falling into that concept. The concept is already pre-given and then the individual aspects fall into it. Rather, it seems Deleuze is reversing that and saying it's the things that come together that form the set or therefore the concept. You know, makes sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, rereading that again. Uh, similarly, the components of a concept are not like individual terms falling under a given concept. Uh, emphasis on given. Well, my emphasis here. Yeah. So the concept does not precede its objects that uh, it unifies. So rather, they are intensive elements, pure singularities, such as the individual subject in a state of nature, the subject of natural law, and so on. The relations between these components involve a certain kind of rendering consistent of their components. Deleuze and Guattari describe concept as the intensive and variable unity of their components. A concept is the point of coincidence, condensation, or accumulation of its own components. Uh, so in this sense, uh, for Deleuze, the concept of, for example, an apple would be all of the individual elements that come together to make the apple. And then each of these individual, those individual elements is obviously itself a concept. You know, the cell's a concept, the atom's a concept, molecule, whatever, chemistry. In that they already are differentiated, you know, they're composed of individual things which have histories of whatever have come and gone. So is this like uh, the argument you guys had with Rebel about the individual and the universal? I don't Not know because really I literally fine. don't remember talking to Rebel. That that's how much, it, that's like how much an impression he left on me. Except for that one time he came on Mumble and I just called him an idiot. Yeah. Well, Hyperion, is this about the same subject then? No, not really. This is like a structure of the... Uh, well, kind of. Like, uh, I guess the individual relation between the parts and then the particular atoms and the stem and the leaf and the seeds and skin and so on make up the apple. But the full concept of the apple would be like the true universal, not just the apple itself, but the relations between everything and the future apples that it creates and so on. Okay. But, yeah. I mean, yeah. I get what he's saying here. Like, that's actually one of the things that I've been thinking about. Like, how can Deleuze, like, I don't know how Deleuze uh, intends to explain uh, things which are clearly not just coincidental condensations or accumulations of just random components. Animals, sure, like living things are not that at all. You know, stuff like, even the, even stuff below that, you know, chemistry is just not a random thing. Certain, there are certain rules to the way chemistry works. Uh, it just doesn't happen, you know. So there, there's an issue here, at least so far, with this basic uh, conceptualization of concept which makes it uh, unexplainable how we have concepts uh, of you know developing beings such that we understand them to be a unity we understand that they have a principle of development to which they subordinate themselves to uh, so yeah uh, it should be interesting uh, how he explains that and I know he must explain that because he definitely had like a very big interest in life, in the concept of life. Uh, all right, so uh, continuing. Uh, in this sense, vague, that meaning concepts, suggest, oh, 
uh, sorry, in this sense they, Deleuze and Guattari suggest, concepts are both absolute, considered as wholes, or as they say, posited all at once, and relative to their components, to other concepts, and to the problems which they are supposed to resolve. The components and their consistency in a particular concept are two distinct dimensions of the concept, but related in that the consistency is established only by means of a certain communication between the components. For example, in Hobbes, the relative weakness of human beings combined with the rationality ensures acceptance of those rational precepts of self-preservation in a state of nature, which lead directly to the compact to establish a sovereign power. Ah, so already that, that already hints to like <laughs> his own answer to what I was saying. Yeah. So what do you think about that? About what he said about the concept, you know, the concept or okay. Um I don't have that much of a problem with it. Really. Uh, I don't know what he means by, you know, they suggest that concepts are both absolute and relative. Um, absolute considered as wholes or as they say positive as once. Yeah. Like a concept, and then you say a concept, and that's the concept, and everyone's supposed to understand it. And then relative to, like, other concepts, I guess. Yeah, they're components and, which are other concepts, and it's the problems yeah, which they're so supposed to resolve. So everything that lies under that umbrella of the concept is, uh, is the relative. I don't know why they say and absolute, though. I mean, that yeah. trips me up, because, well, like, I... Absolute as in, like... Concrete, I guess, is what they mean. Maybe a concrete hole. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, they don't mean it in a Hegelian sense, but nonetheless, that's even yeah. I mean, even in a normal sense, that just seems like a weird way to say it. Unchanging would be maybe a better word. Uh, no. Uh, well, total. <laughs> yeah, probably total seems yeah. closer. You know, they're total in that you know they're given all at once. Yeah. The whole well, concept total, is the entire unity. It's not like parts. I, don't know. I think it's at, all like, there in absolute. Trickling. Like totality's there in absolute. Uh, unchangingness, you know, because it's completed. So yeah. Posited all at once, quote unquote. That's what they said. That's very apt, I think. Sorry, at the end, I was thinking about Hobbes, because I was thinking, well, I wonder what he would think about how his uh, ideas have been bastardized. <laughs> I mean, the Hobbes example explains, you know, the coming about of a concept, but, you know, once concept is established, the concept, I guess, is absolute, and that it is what it is. Yeah. But uh, that seems wrong, because this is the guy who loves difference uh, over identity, so... Yeah, but he has to have some sort of concreteness until we'll or else see. people won't understand it at all. I don't think he cared. <laughs> all right. So, all right, continuing. Concepts have a history which may include their history as components of other concepts and the relations to particular problems. Concepts are always created in relation to specific problems. A concept lacks meaning to the extent that it is not connected to other concepts and is not linked to a problem that it resolves or helps to resolve. The history of concepts, therefore, includes the variations they undergo in their migration from one problem to another. In any concept that Lewis and Guattari suggest, there are usually bits or components that come from other concepts which correspond to other problems and presuppose other planes. The concept of contract has a long history in political thought prior to Hobbes, but this does not mean that there is a single concept or, con or contractarian tradition which stretches all the way from the Greeks via Hobbes and locked to Rawls. Rather, there are a number of traditions in which the contract takes on a distinct character and serves a specific end. The contract is transformed in part by virtue of the specific problem to which it relates in each case, whether this be the constitutional legitimation of civil authority or mor of morality, or the distinctive political relation between ruler and ruled. Hobbes' problem is the constitution and legitimation of coercive political authority. Rawls' contractarian theory of justice is designed to solve a different problem, namely the problem of the principles of a just society. This concept of political liberalism is conceived as a response to yet another problem. 
How is it possible that there may exist over time a stable and just society of free and equal citizens, profoundly divided by reasonable, though incompatible, religious, philosophical, and moral doctrines? Yeah, that was a quote from Rawls. Uh, the book Rawls, right? Uh, I don't know. Written by Rawls, sure. 1993. Yeah. I'm sure that's from uh, his famous book. The Theory of Justice. So what do you think about that? What do you think about specifically about the problem relation, you know? So the concepts are arise to answer problems. Well, that's what they're supposed to do. I think, I mean, that's how I've always taken it. What, do you have a different approach? No, I mean it's a it's, it's an obvious observation. I think at the same time, there's part of me that thinks this is sort of an illegitimate consideration of concepts. In that, it's considering something that's other than concepts themselves. You know, the reason why a concept exists and what a concept is is two different things. Uh, at least that's Hegel's on take on it, and I agree. Uh, I think one has to make the obvious distinctions, you know, between the becoming of a thing on as a total thing and then the thing itself. You know, the history of how we came to have the state is not identical to the concept of the state and is not really part of the concept of the state, uh, so to say, uh, at least in rational form. It's now, just an abstraction. Nah, so if but if you look at it empirically, if you want to talk about some sort of empirical concept, uh, yeah. in which case, I mean, the whole thing literally, you're you're gonna if you do that, I think uh, Deleuze falls into a monist uh, trap of well, then everything just has is nothing but the history of its conditions of possibility, and everything has conditions of possibility, and therefore, when you finally try to get to wh what is the final condition of possibility, uh, you won't find it in the empirical history. Mm -hmm. So you're either this going by, changed. so you're either going by like a metaphysical condition of possibility, or you're going by a, an empirical condition of possibility, and I don't think you can mix that. It doesn't make sense to me that you would. Yeah, but I don't think he would. I mean, from what we've read of him, I would say that he probably thinks that nothing is able to be. Uh, absolute but concrete in that it won't ever change you know because i mean he gave the example of the mountain how you see it now as this giant thing that that you know, it's going to eventually disappear as well yeah and that's exactly a really in my opinion that's a stupid point because that's exactly <laughs> what you don't care about with concepts like a mountain is still yeah. me a mount, what a mountain means is still what a mountain means in concept as opposed to yeah. what a mountain is uh, yeah, what a empirically mountain is, is a contingent uh, formation which obviously people don't think of it that way but it is so i mean this goes I mean, into whole, a, a whole thing it goes into a whole distinction least. between like contingent and necessary concepts in my opinion and like contingent concepts are to me garbage uh, we use them all yeah. the time yes but at the same time like there's no philosophical interest to be had in them You know, it's like uh, some philosophers make this whole big uh, nonsense about, like, you know, at which point, logically, you know, do you, does a little pile turn into, like, a bunch? Yeah. And, you know, the whole That's thing is these are just me. empirical concepts. Like, they actually don't have any meaning. You yeah, know, they are what whatever we feel. Bricks become a house. That's what someone asked me. At what uh, point when, do I take know, away bricks actually... until it is no longer a house? Like, <laughs> well, a pile well, of bricks... I guess when it no longer resembles a house? Yeah, a pile of bricks is a house when it's finally, you know, a house. Yeah. You know, that's kind I mean, of like the whole thing. I mean, if you tear out a wall, it's still a house, but it's not a total concept of a house because a house requires four walls and the roof. It's a and house man. with a hole in it. <laughs> According to the law, it's not a house. It's yeah, a, and I don't a, think it's, it's a condemned that, building. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's that much of a 
an interesting point, really. Well, yeah, because they're empirical concepts. Like, they're not necessary concepts. A house is whatever the fuck we think a house is. A yeah. rock. You can live under a rock. That's your, that's <laughs> it can be a house. Yeah. Sure, why not? I mean, look, Patrick Starr for SpongeBob lives under a rock. That's a house. <laughs> yeah. SpongeBob lives in a fucking pineapple. That's a house. Yeah, but it has... Yeah, but the, they do have the structure, the concept of a house with four walls and a roof. Like, house. Even if his four walls are sand and a rock above it. You know, but it's it, not, like it's not four walls. It's a circle. He, like his house. Well, yeah, I know. Under the, you know what the I mean. thing like is a circle. Cir- it's okay, but it's like it's in, an enclosed space because it's a depression in the, under the sea and the floor and then a rock on top of it. So it's like you know, it has the. Oh, what about something like a cave? <laughs> like a cave, a cave could that be has a cave house. Yeah. 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 Be housed in a cave. Okay, my uh, example of four walls and a and a roof has been defeated, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Modern architecture <laughs> dictates that it's basically Sure thing. Four Next thing you'll tell me that man is a federalist biped with nails. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Uh, nails that. Uh... Wait, no, never mind. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What does uh, create human life? <laughs> so, I mean, when he's talking about... So, anyways, going back to this whole thing, uh, the cons- when he says concepts have a history, he's talking about an empirical history, or at least uh, the contingent history that we we experience. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, empirically, I agree. Uh, you know, philosophically, I just have a... I don't think it's really something of interest it's a sociological thing of interest uh, but it's not a philosophical thing of interest in my, as I can tell alright continuing to some degree, Deleuze and Guattari's concept of philosophical concepts resembles the Wittgensteinian notion of open concepts, which was once used to support the thesis of the, quote, essential contestability, unquote, of political concepts. In this view, concepts such as democracy are essentially contestable because they are complex and involve a number of component features, the relative importance of which may be weighted differently. As a result, the conditions of applicability of the concept leave room for dispute in particular cases. For Deleuze and Guattari, too, concepts are open or indeterminate in this sense. However, their primary concern is not with the difficulty of determining the limits of particular concepts, but rather with the manner in which concepts are defined by the bridges or pathways along which they may be transformed into other concepts. Because concepts are always created in relation to particular problems, and because different problems themselves may be interconnected, any given concept will be located in a series of virtual relations to other concepts. These virtual relations with other concepts constitute the becoming of the concept in question. Concepts enter into such a virtual relations when the elements of one become indiscernible from those of another. These relations, in turn, form particular paths along with, conce- with the concept, eh, along which the concept might be transformed into something else. Consider the concept of power, which informs Hobbes' account of the social contract. His argument that individuals in this state of nature become caught up in a com- competitive drive for ever more power appears to anticipate Nietzsche's will to power. In fact, it is not the same concept of power in each case. From the, from the Nietzschean perspective of power as an, as an active force, Hobbes' conception of power is reactive and his social contract amounts to the constitution of a community of slaves whose only remedy for the inability to keep promises is to establish a power sufficient to compel observance by fear of punishment. Nevertheless, Hobbes does canvas, only to put aside as implausible, another basis upon which people might be held to their contracts, namely the moral strength of those individuals whose pride does not permit them to break their word. By contrast, Nietzsche and invokes precisely. He was wrong. <laughs> uh, by contrast, Nietzsche invokes precisely this noble character type in envisaging the possibility of a sovereign individual who has the right to make a promise. 
Nietzsche is commonly criticized for his individualism and his lack of any constant political community, yet by retracting, retracing this path from a reactive towards an active power, which must be regarded as a potential inherent in Nietzsche's constant of will to power, we can envisage a transformation in the constant of political community, which is the outcome of the social contract. I can agree with that. It's, it's I'm sorry, no, I don't agree with that. Like, what? No, no way like, there will ever be a society in which I trust people to make promises. There's, no. <laughs> No, I can I trust sir, I can right trust right I can trust certain individuals that, okay. that I know very well to make <laughs> promises. I will not trust sure. people in society to make promises to me. Okay, no, that's not what I Which meant. Which is why I agree. we shouldn't have I democracy. With... Okay, no, but I agree with what he said about uh you know, the, Nietzsche's concept of the will to power being uh expressly like it can be expressed in political terms it doesn't have to he doesn't have to have uh actual political opinions for us to draw conclusions from what he said to apply to the political sure but the thing is if yeah. you try to take the chinism into political sphere it's utopianism man it's like the bad yeah, kind of idealism but i didn't say i agree with that <laughs> i said i agree that with what he said about nietzsche not that i agree with nietzsche like you know, I'm sure that Hobbes didn't deny. Like you know, he entertains the opinion, like the the possibility for just a moment. And it says, well, obviously that's not going to happen, not because there don't exist individuals yeah. who can't make promises, but because the vast majority of people don't give a fuck to keep a promise to you. Yeah, that's why he put forth the Leviathan because he thought that the second one, you know, he said he put it aside as implausible. I mean, he talks about it uh, that you know they're they're going to be moral agents and say, oh well, I don't want to tell a lie or do something wrong because I'm I want to be seen as a morally upstanding person because that's my that's a thing to aspire to well if we've learned anything from like modern life it's that no one cares about that sort of thing truly I mean they may say that they do but they really don't you know, like or even in, in the older a... cultures I mean come on people always yeah. oh, yeah. people have always so, like, lied like they like I don't oh, buy to this whole noble savage thing I think there are nicer cultures <laughs> but I don't think there's like any saintly cultures in which like everybody like actually cares like no not everybody cares well, like really cares about being the good person for the sake of being good but most people are good for you know the sake of something else well yeah we're only good uh, in a sort of social contract of course we only resist our urge to kill people because others also agree to resist that urge well that and like he said uh fear of punishment yeah you're saying Hobbes thinks that right not that you think that because if you think that uh no he's don't, don't move that. next door to me that's what let the, me just tell he's you. saying that he's saying that's what the social contract is supposed to be and it yeah is. for Hobbes yeah, and Rousseau. Except the social contract never really happens. It's like, you know, the thing is the state is established well, and then the state is just like enforced upon you no matter what. Yeah, but you do enter into a social contract with others, but it's by fear of of punishment. I mean, there you know, for me, it's not, it's just that I don't want to kill people or whatever. Yeah, fear of, huh? Or fear of loss. I mean, like, Part of the reason, like the Loss. we have like the legal social contract, is because you enter into certain things and you don't want to lose. You know, it's like you enter into business, you don't want to get stolen from. You, it's a protection yeah. from you as well as for you. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, definitely uh, makes me think of like Kant's categorical imperative. Which so, I mean, like, the whole thing about, like, Hobbes Leviathan and being slavish, yeah, you know, his version particularly is, but uh, it doesn't have to yeah, be, because democracy no. can do exactly what Hobbes <laughs> wants, except Hobbes sure, obviously but... hates democracy because he thinks people are stupid, and he's kind of right, he's, <laughs> at least in the modern well, day, they'd be stupefied. The... Well, we have to acknowledge that America's not a democracy, really. You know, it's not ruled by the people, it's, it's a republic, it's... I don't know. Half half the electorate, like us. half the electorate, literally thinks it is because know, they vote but... Republican and they vote well, openly yeah. against their own interests. I mean, it it is. It's not as democracy should be. No. Ideally, 
it's not as Republic should be. That too, but, but at the same time, it is, and that's kind of that's an interesting point. Like that's something worth discussing. But his whole thing about yeah. how concepts shift, like yeah, the whole probably not thing. We should have a <laughs> we should have a separate thing because I have a lot to say about this. Well, um, there's a fine. Oh, I mean, I we do have plenty of time. As well, of course. I mean, because like, let's because this is a good example. I mean, like applied the applied philosophy. Let's like bring this down into like what matters, because that's what we're why we're reading this. By the way, I mean, it isn't just to read it yeah. and just like, oh, well, that was what Deleuze says, you know. Well, uh, I read the, the comments on it. Yeah, the comments we make on these are like <laughs> pretty much are working out through this, and I think this is important yeah. what he says about the shifting of concepts, and that's actually one thing I hate, because the fact that the concepts are shifting shows we didn't really have. A solid concept to begin concept. with, yeah, yeah, exactly. a, a concrete concept. The fact that we can uh, conceive yeah. that you know the first democracy was conceived as, you know, just direct democracy, and there are people who like they are the anarchists and they are the others of the communalists, uh, and uh, well, not communalists like Bookchin, I mean, uh, commun communizers, communalists, yeah, uh, who sort of have uh, not all of them, but some of them definitely have this whole direct democracy is the only true democracy. But that's not true. Yeah. Because if democracy just like, you know, uh, self-rule of people by the people, uh, you can have many varied uh, forms of that in which, you know, the Leninists will then say, look, you know, our one party rule is democracy. You know, we represent yeah. in, in lieu of the people. You know, they, uh, you know, our party maybe is they, the uh, people. Yeah, our yeah. party is the people. And so they've shifted the, the meaning of democracy, not fundamentally, but at least in the way it appears. Uh, then you get, you know, the uh, parliaments, uh, parliamentary democracy. You get a representational democracy, the kind of things we do have here. And you have various forms of that. And then, then you, you get, get to uh, the idea that capitalism is democracy, that markets are democratic. Yeah, there's the shift of that. There's also the shift, you know, as you could have a democratic monarchy. <laughs> you know, constitutional monarchy, yeah. basically. And uh, the, the concept is shifty, and um, it's not that that's bad, I think. Uh, it's not that it's bad. I think it's bad that there are these various ways to consider democracy because, oh, they're false democracies. No, that's not what's bad about it. Because, uh, as a matter of fact, I think all those forms of democracy, if they really like, were held to what they uh, intend, or at least they claim to intend, uh, they would be democracy nonetheless, I think. You know, yeah. uh, depends whatever people want. You know, some people want direct democracy, fine. Some people like to represent democracy, fine. Some people want, like, parliaments. Some people want Congress and Senate. It's fine. I don't care. Uh, it, if it is the self-rule of the people, then it is democracy. It doesn't matter what in-between steps there are. And maybe that's just exactly what the concept of democracy really only implies. So are you shifting the concept of democracy or is it really or that you're shifting the way you enact democracy? You know, uh, well, does suddenly um, like uh, voting and not in a booth, but like voting online and, you know, uh, <laughs> use your social security as a login or something. Is does that change the concept of democracy? I don't know. Does it, you know, instead of like Congress doing that, does that change the concept of democracy? I don't think so. You know, it changes how we live democracy, but, uh, Maybe it changes our concept, our concrete concept, but that concrete concept is already arbitrary, anyways. So, but we have to acknowledge that there is no perfect thing. Like that's that's why he had the concept of the Leviathan because I don't even think he believed it was possible. It was, they said earlier it was the artificial person. Uh, that don't exist. <laughs> well, yeah, and that you know, it's a state. It could be the king, like you know, he yeah. argues for the king, but it can be any yeah. state because the From state Hegel's is the yeah, the state is the Leviathan. Yeah, and as Hegel observed, the king is just there to sign papers as an idiot. So you know, the point of the Leviathan is everybody gives up their right to uh, violence to the Leviathan so that it is the only valid force of violence and enforcer of right but that way you know suddenly you're not afraid suddenly you know you're not afraid of your neighbor all that much uh, they can still break the law but hey uh, then the state yeah. comes in the state which is more far stronger than you can come and kick their ass unless they have money in which case you're fucked <laughs> yeah Yeah, 
I mean, Plato knew that there was no best uh, form of government. I mean, he, he outlined four of them, right? Four or five. Did he? Well, I mean, I, I heard, like, he re rewrote, like, the Republic, like, something like... A, a, yeah. Oh, no. What That's was it, what like, 30 about. times or some about, shit uh, over his life? Like, before he I'm published talking about, it? Okay, there's one I'm missing. The five regimes is what I'm talking about. Aristocracy, democracy... Which, no, that's uh, Aristotle. Claims we live in now. No, this is Plato. What? No, that was Plato's sure five regimes. The... Yeah. No. I didn't know sure. he had yeah, those. I think it's Plato. No, because I know Aristotle, Aristotle does. Uh... No, he, he was basing it on Plato. Then he's talking about uh, the five regimes. They're the five classical types of regimes in re the Republic. Uh, what did I say? Aristocracy, timocracy, which Winfield claims we are in now oligarchy, uh, democracy, and the last one. Oh, tyranny. Tyranny is the last one. Because <laughs> uh, he, he thought uh, there was a degeneration of society, uh, and they passed through these stages. You know, he's probably he's probably right. <laughs> it sure feels yeah. like historically it sort of is that way. So you think we're uh, we're moving towards tyranny? Yeah, like I mean, yeah. it's tyrannical, like oligarchy, but nonetheless, it's tyranny. Well, yeah, because they can be they can be mixed. Yeah, they can be mixed, but oligarchy is the like uh, rule few, of the rich, rule of few, everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we have that kind of now. It's just not like a, what's that movie? Uh, Hunger Games. It's not like open like that. Where yeah. they all live in one area and have a ruling class like that. Uh, well, you could also out. argue we have a very democratic tyranny as well. Yeah. We have corporate fascism. Consumer <laughs> fascism. Consumer <laughs> fascism. All right, so uh, good discussion. Getting Let's back move to on. Toulouse or what? Yeah. Continuing, Deleuze's reconstruction is the work of philosophers such as Bergson. By the way, Bergson is like uh, one of the people who had the whole like a uh, vitalism, Elan Vital. Yeah, Henri Bergson. Uh, Spinoza, Kant, Nietzsche, or Foucault were always attentive to the problems addressed in their work. However, what is philosophy goes further in making the inherent susceptibility to variation or transformation a defining characteristic of philosophical concepts. Here, the essential indeterminacy of philosophical concepts is contrasted with the determinacy of mathematical or propositional functions, which are the objects of science and logic. Um, I disagree. I think philosophical concepts are very determinate. The only reason they appear in determinates because uh, we historically we were very, very unsystematic with them. Therefore, you know, you couldn't specifically situate concepts. You know. Yeah. Think about system. how people say it. They say my conception. So, like, they have to agree upon a concept. I agree with you that a concept is a thing. Agree upon the concept of what it is. Then it's kind of meaningless. Like, uh. Yeah, and it's not philosophical. I had an <laughs> argument with someone. Yeah, I know. But I had an argument with someone that we know. Uh, I, don't, I don't like naming names. Uh, about, the, about the noble savage or whatever. We had a different conception of it. So the concept of noble savage exists, but he didn't really understand what it fully was. So he, like, raged against it, you know? And then once I explained it, he was like, oh, okay, now I understand it better. So, you know, the concept exists, but you have to agree upon the concept for it to make sense. And a concept is there. It's supposed to be a thing that you're supposed to know, you know, like you understand the concept. And I think that's the point that Deleuze is trying to make, that, like, if you don't understand everything that builds up into the concept, then you're going to have a bad, I don't want to use the word conception, but <laughs> that makes that's the only thing I can think of, a bad conception of what that concept truly is. Well, I don't think Deleuze is going to say there is a true concept. Okay. 
Well, yeah, we disagree with them on that point, but because um, that's what that's the he's saying. Yeah. The con because yeah. he said a concept is talk is made up of its components, which are also yeah, concepts. Yeah, and if the components shift, yeah. and the concept is gone, and but they would have to be. They don't endure. Those components. Those components would have to be concrete to be able to be discernible enough to add up into something else. Checkmate, I guess. Yeah, that's where like stuff like the virtual <laughs> I think comes in, and like those aren't supposed to be concrete. Like it's supposed to be indeterminate, indeterminate yet different, indeterminate difference. You know, which comes into mm -hmm. concrete actuality. Uh, and then I am, I'm just talking in my ass. Still. Never mind. Yeah, I don't well, know enough. I think it made sense. I don't know. <laughs> we'll we'll get we'll find out if we ever find out. So, uh, continuing, whereas philosophy forms concepts on a plane of immanence, science establishes functions on a plane of reference. The history of science involves the construction of such planes of reference and the specification of relevant coordinates in terms of which functions may be determined. In the case of logic, the Frigian definition of a concept as a function from individuals to a truth value defines a thoroughly determinate extensional multiplicity. So I'm, I I think I get a gist. Has Gottlob Frege yet? Has he? Uh, he no. just says Frege like we're supposed to know. <laughs> well, I mean, it's like, this is like... I mean, we true. know, yeah, but... Yeah. He just... Like, whenever I name drop someone, I'm like, this person. Yeah, this is what they believe. Yeah. You can look at people can Wikipedia nowadays. So it's not. So I know, bad. but people don't like. Well, anyone that's can not Google our problem. Anything, but I'm still asked basic questions. All time. Well, the yeah. thing too is like a name is associated with, um, you know, a whole method behind it, or like you know, a whole theory, like what that person thought. So if they're not familiar with that person, and you're name dropping them, it can be difficult, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but uh, this is. Not too hard to stuff, at least not for you. True, true. Yeah, so I, mean, I, I, I kind of get an idea. Got the Frigga. Like Hobbes, sure. Locke, sure. Frigga. I mean, he's popular, but, you know. Goddamn Neo Frigians. <laughs> Do they, they exist? exist? They exist. Oh, God. You know, uh, it, like it literally, it's 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 almost like almost like clockwork, man. It takes like about a century for like somebody to shit talk and disprove someone, and then people come back. Wait a minute, that it wasn't a real disproof. You know, th th there's like a lot more complex than we thought. Like there are neo Frigians like complain about how Russell like didn't BTFO Frega and like Frega gave up too easily on his project when he could have kept going on forward. But anyways, this is Deleuze. Yeah. So, in the case of logic, the Frigian definition of a concept as a function from individuals to a truth value defines a thoroughly determinate extensional multiplicity. In both science and logic, the determinate character of functions is ensured by the independence of the variables which define the relevant system of reference. By contrast, in philosophy, the components of concepts are neither constants nor variables, but pure and simple variations ordered according to their neighborhood. Within a given concept, these components are like so many intensive ordinates arranged in zones of neighborhood or indiscernibility, which define the consistency of the concept. Components remain distinct, but something passes from one to the other, something that is undecidable between them. Uh, so I'm not quite sure... Uh... Like, plane right. of imminence and plane of reference uh, don't seem too complex. It's just yeah. I, mean, I I need a bit more for plane of imminence. Plane of reference seems a, a lot more easy to understand. You know, it's the... Uh, think of a plane, like a geometric plane. And, you know, it's... You have their logic and uh, the functions of logic, you know, which relate to each other. So I can get uh, that. I can get how science, you know, is a determinant, is a functional thing of relating variables to... Uh, you know, whatever they refer, the individuals they refer to. Uh, I guess it's just like the things inside. But the plane, plane of imminence, 
uh, is that literally it? You know, it's just like everything's within the plane. The 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 plane of things that are within it, I guess. You know, like the plane is just a a, a canvas for stuff, and then like everything within it is contained within the plane of eminence, right? It's opposition to transcendence or whatever. So inside. Yeah. By contrast in philosophy, the components of consciousness are neither consistent nor mirrors, but appear in simple variations ordered according to their neighborhood. So the neighborhood would be the whole plane of eminence. Would it? I mean, the concept? Uh, so the neighborhood? Um... So, you know, like, literally, it's like a neighborhood, right? You have a, a row yeah. of houses, like, you know, shaped like a circle. Let's just make it easy. Or a square. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Deleuze's whole thing was, like, okay, con the concept isn't doesn't perceive the thing. The things make the concept. So that the fact that they are within that forms the concept, but now they are within the concept. Yeah. And that is the plane of imminence, right? Yeah. Yeah, because we're talking about the concept as a thing with things in it, so... You know, everything within it is in the plane of eminence, and it functions on a plane of reference because it 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 goes up against other concepts. You know, not goes up against like battles or whatever, but you know, it it exists as a concept, and other concepts coexist with it on the plane yeah, of reference. But... So it functions on the plane of reference. He says. All right. Uh... Are you reading this from something sense. else? Or, uh... No, I'm reading it from the sentence that <laughs> he said. It says, whereas philosophy forms concepts on a plane of eminence, science establishes functions on a plane of reference. All right. Uh... I mean, unless I'm dumb. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It just I mean, sounds I, like you're drawing something that I don't know. Some... No. No, uh, and they were like, I don't quite see it here. Oh, yeah, let's read the last sentence. Within a given concept, these components so within you know the plane of eminence, a given concept, these components, the things that compose the concept, are like so many intensive meaning with inside, ordinates yeah. inside, arranged in zones of neighborhood, or indiscernibility, which define the consistency of the concepts. Okay, where are you reading? I lost my page. The, the bottom of that paragraph, uh, page 15, top paragraph. Right after the parentheses where it says uh, Deleuze and Guattari, 1994, page 20. Oh, okay. Okay, okay, yeah. I was still on the last pair, last sentence, I think. Still trying to figure out the neighborhood thing. Yeah, so within a given concept, these components are like so many intensive ordinates arranged in zones of neighborhood or indiscernibility, which define the consistency of the concept. Components remain distinct, but something passes from one to the other, something that is undecidable between them. Okay, I... Huh. So I'm not sure what this means. So the plane of it, whatever is within the plane of eminence, whatever is within the concept, is itself not determinate? You know, the indiscernibility part, you know, they're intensive coordinates, you know, coordinates within the plane, arranged in zones of neighborhood. So, um, what would it arranged be, you know? Like little houses in a so row. It would, no, right. the zones of neighborhood would be like, uh, what would it be? Like, because that would be like sub concepts. That's the only thing that makes, makes sense to me. Yeah, the components. Yeah, so, but then, like, components arranged in zones of neighborhood. Concepts. Oh, so it, so the concept is the whole neighborhood, right? And arranged yeah. in zones of neighborhood would just mean, like, they're in a zone in the neighborhood, right? Uh, I guess, like, the individual houses. and the Yeah, land, the individual right? houses. Yeah. And then, so they're distinct, but something passes from one to the other. Because they all have to connect how to build up into the concept something you know within a given concept between them 
Yeah, within a Wait, given concept, okay. these components Starting are mixing. like indiscernibility. Yeah. Or zone or like so many intensive ordinates arranged in zones of neighborhood or <laughs> or or arranged in zones of indiscernibility which define the consistency of the concept. Okay, indiscernibility is okay. like indefinable, right? Or not tell you can't tell. Yeah. I'm try like okay. You can't tell them apart or what? Cuz okay, I'm having a bunch of different thoughts at the moment about the last sentence which is or the last uh sentence fragment which is something that is undecidable between them yeah i need an example like i think i i'm not quite sure what it's referring to because you know because uh, what i'm trying to relate what i'm immediately related to is like something other than limit in which oh yeah the uh, transition you can never like through the transition you never quite see the transition itself it happens yeah. but you couldn't tell it you know, you once you got the whole thing, in... once you got the whole thing, you can tell it easily, but within it, you can't tell it. Yeah, and between them, it's undecidable because they yeah, because you say... know, is it the limit? Because you know, <laughs> between the limit of something and other, yeah. it is indiscernible. Is it of the something or is it of the other? But it's both, and it's neither. Yeah. So that that kind of example makes sense to me. But in something. Which, uh, that... Pa not that something, but the something that he says here that passes from one to the other, that connects them, uh, that makes them build up into the concept, is undecidable between them because like they don't have a say in whether or not they're building up towards a concept they're doing it anyway, because they're relating to one another to build into the concept. I don't know. Yeah, actually, I'm no. What you just made, what you made, is, what you yeah. said makes sense. You know that if the <laughs> yeah, components course, remain but... distinct, but something passes from one to the other, would be the concept, something that yeah. is undecidable between them. You know, between a, between any of the components, like the concept isn't there; it's only there as a whole, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm not bullshitting. Like I know what I'm saying. It's just <laughs> I I'm trying to think about it in terms of a neighborhood, and it's not connecting. I guess well, like if, uh... if you live in a house and then you know there's a house built beside you and beside you and beside you and so on, they eventually build up into a neighborhood. But you didn't really like intend for it to be a neighborhood if you're just house there or whatever. So the many concepts build up into a bigger concept and form that concept. All right. Uh... <laughs> not sure. Not sure that applied yeah. to what I was. I mean, he said, well, he but... says neighborhood shit, so I'm just yeah. thinking about a neighborhood. We'll, we'll see. Okay. Um, continuing. I'm sorry for my oligophrenic borderline oligophrenic ramblings. Yeah, you're forgiven. At this point, Deleuze and Guattari's concept of philosophical concepts enters into a strange proximity with that of Derrida. In their terms, we might say that it is precisely such a zone of undecidability between spoken and written signification or communication that defines the deconstructive concept of writing in general. More generally, there are surprising similarities between the Deleuzean and deconstructive concepts of specifically philosophical concepts. Just as Deleuze and Guattari insist upon the specificity of concepts as they define them to philosophy, so Derrida distinguishes his distinctively dis deconstructive concepts from ordinary philosophical concepts by calling them quasi-concepts or a-conceptual concepts. <laughs> Derrida accepts the ordinary logic of concept formation according to which a concept only exists when there is a distinction. It is impossible or illegitimate to form a philosophical concept outside this logic of all or nothing. At the same yeah. time, his practice of philosophy as a kind of double writing produces, eh, produces its own distinctive series of philosophical quasi-concepts. Writing, mark, trace, supplement, difference, iterability, and so on. In effect, the procedure is one by which deconstruction moves from ordinary concepts of writing or of cinders to another kind of concept, heterogeneous to the, philosophical, to the philosophical concept of the concept. By philosophical concept of the concept, Derrida means the traditional view according to which concepts are determinate ideal entities serving to identify regular kinds. Yeah, we have a concept of what a concept is. 
Such concepts are not indeterminate or fuzzy, but conform to the logic of exclusive disjunction. Things either do or do not fall under them. Yeah. So cat okay. falls under the concept of animal, but rock does not. <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, that's clear. That's, I'm not getting the what's supposed to be fuzzy and un, un, like uh, undecidable here. Are not indeterminate or fuzzy? I mean, you can't say that a rock is an animal. Well, no, no. I mean, so like there. So we get what we get. What like the regular concept is. You know, it's. They yeah. they admit that it's you know the usual idea is that it's a determinable determinate thing that definitely puts things in and out, but yeah, it's all uh, the concepts he okay. Um, I think the the you know where it says right there after the parentheses there done nineteen eighty eight one seventeen. At the same time, his practice of philosophy as a kind of double writing produces its own distinctive series of philosophical quasi concepts: writing, mark, trace, supplement, difference, iterability, and so on. Yeah, these are the ones that he uses. So, so he's using what makes them to try to... What makes them quasi-concepts, though? Is it because, like, you uh, know, there is no them... actual definition of concept of writing? You know, which, like, what well, is writing? You know, is writing okay, just his... writing? Yeah, his quasi-concepts are the deconstructive concepts. But he needs concepts to to explain them. So that, that in that they're quasi concepts, they're the aconceptual concepts that, that deconstruct concepts. I've never okay. I've only read the Specters of Marx by Derrida, and it was kind of confusing, but I enjoyed it. Everything else I've tried to attempt to read, I just didn't understand really. At he's all. like he's almost completely incomprehensible. I mean, like On a purpose. friend of mine. Yeah, a friend of mine who read him said that um, he learned more about Derrida by um by reading books about him than actually reading him like he's one of yeah. those thinkers yeah like Lacan requires uh, yeah Alan. basically yeah, yeah but like yeah. the, the anyway. people who seem to understand Derrida like and love him like say uh, uh, something similar along the delusion lines that the whole point of his writing style is to just utterly confuse you and take everything like literally deterritorialize language and writing yeah I don't know how that's good, and which is why, like, there literally are people who have made an argument, and actually, when you think about it, okay, it's a decent argument, but fuck, like, it's stupid. Okay. In that, like, Remember, you know, like Pomo, okay. you know, like Po, like you've seen like the weird Pomo yeah. shit, like generators, that there yeah. are people who literally yeah. do write like that. Yeah. And there sure. are people who will say, who will excuse it and say, but they wrote on that on the purpose that they completely took all these other words that you normally know. And they put them to a completely different context, or they took something that's normal that you already know, but completely put it in other different terms to completely deterritorialize, decontextualize, and make you actually yeah. think about it. For Maybe. like, really, you know, just, <laughs> you have to discover it and work through the text as text. Yeah, not, I mean, like, uh, not I prefer automatic writing uh, to that. <laughs> Deli da, I mean, Deli da even says that he doesn't like fixed definitions. So, yeah, make of that what you will i mean when he was asked so. about an example of deconstruction which is seinfeld the deconstruction <laughs> of the normal sitcom he said that i don't think that deconstruction can produce any sort of sitcom well he so said like he was saying like, is undefinable yeah or something and he extent. thinks that yeah. deconstruction like is as a concept is is undefinable but there are things that lie outside of it that are all or nothing but it's an all or nothing thing and he doesn't recognize Seinfeld. Granted, he he didn't under he didn't know what Seinfeld was. He just heard sitcom, and he'd probably seen some shitty French sitcoms, and was like, "No, those don't get deconstruct anything." But Seinfeld itself is a deconstruction of sitcoms. Uh, what's that show we like? The Eric Andre Show is a deconstruction of uh, late night talk shows, and so on. So when it's applied to something, he doesn't like it. <laughs> I mean, it makes you wonder what he would think about the uh, the selfie academics on the internet today who like to throw around his uh, terminology. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, I, I still don't get this. I mean, uh, going back to the top just, of that paragraph, in their terms, okay. we might say that it is precisely such a zone of undecidability between spoken and written signification or communication that defines the deconstructive concept of writing in general. 
I don't get it. What's undecidable between spoken and written signification? I mean, obviously, I haven't thought about okay, this with any you? depth at the top of the, you go that up paragraph. All the, all the way at the top at this point? That paragraph. Okay, yeah. Okay. The second sentence. Okay. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> I read it again. So I don't get it. Yeah. I mean, like... You bypassed it, so I assumed we got it at that time, and now I'm, like, looking back and I'm... Okay. Um... The zone of an undecidability between spoken and written signification or communication that defines the deconstructed concept of writing in general. Is he saying that something's lost within writing that, and or language or what? I don't get I mean, what I he mean by undecidability. I mean, you know, it's like, is it you can't tell them apart by just mere definition or something? Yeah. But you need concepts to be able to tell things apart. Yeah, okay. but that's the thing. That's the thing, though. Like they're talking about, like there's a difference that, but we don't, we can't seem to pin down the difference. Yeah. And I think this is just the, I don't know. I since I don't know anything about linguistics or whatever, like I, I don't get this example at all. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Well, there's, I mean, think about like the universal intersubjectivity of language or whatever. We're forced to use words, but we have to rely upon other people to know what we're talking about. We can't just say something and then assume that they... Well, we can't assume that they know, but they may not always know. Yeah, that's what's undecidable here. about that? <laughs> yeah, he's saying... I don't know. I don't, well, get, I don't get what the undecidability is between spoken and written signification. Like, uh, It doesn't make yeah, sense I'm trying to, to me. Make, trying to draw what the undecidable is between the last paragraph when... I was making sense of undecidable and what he means here. I mean, like, writing. Like, writing, like, when he says the well, quasi concepts, okay. that's what I was, like, asking. Like, the, the reason I asked about the quasi concepts is because, like, it seems to make sense to me, like, there is a sort of quasi concept, like writing. Yeah. What What is, what counts as writing? You know, is Chinese writing? Is, a, you know, you know, some people would, like, would look at that and it's like, what? You know, was uh, Sumerian yeah. writing was uh, e the, the most hieroglyphics. Uh, hieroglyphics is the, the yeah, biggest the example that contrasts. Is hieroglyphics writing? You yeah. know, at face yeah. value, one would say like they're paintings, right? But no, I mean they're made to convey language. They were, kind of very yeah, they were things. They were characters uh, that happened to represent like actual things that we would define as pictures, but they were used to create words and tell story so de but to de to deconstruct a concept we have to have the concept of deconstructionism or uh, yeah we have to define the deconstructive concept of writing in general or whatever i don't know I don't know. <laughs> the like, that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I, I don't like, get what's yeah. undecidable here. I mean, with writing, there's some fringe things that I can say, okay, that's undecidable. Uh, like, writing seems uh, kind of like that, you know, if, if you're like... Indecipherable? Is that what you're thinking? No. I don't think it's like indecipherable. No, no, it's undecidability. Oh, okay. He says the word undecidability. Okay. Or, yeah, uh, yeah. what was the other word? I don't remember. Indiscernible. Yeah, indiscernible. And that you can't tell the difference. You know, what's the difference with, like, you know, is, like, a binary code writing? You know, technically, you know, it doesn't look like it is. Yeah. It takes a hell of a lot more effort than it's worth, but could you write in in that? Yeah. Could yeah. you write in Morse code? Yeah. Could you write in, yeah. like, sign language? Yeah. Okay, but what's the point of all of this? I don't know. That, I don't know what... It. I don't get what the undecidability is. I mean, like, okay... Maybe this one makes uh, between sense. Between what's Cause, spoken cause, and written? Because he, he mentions Wittgenstein in the last paragraph. Wittgenstein has this whole thing about famili famili yeah. family resemblances of concepts. And one of them would be like games. You know, what is a game? Yeah. A game is an actual thing that is a fuzzy concept because anything can be a game, literally. You know, the language game, the social game, and so on. 
uh, yeah, you can turn anything into a game, and there is no actual set definition of a game. Yeah. Because, you know, you can turn counting into a game. You can turn... Uh, you can ha you can have a game in which there is no loser, no winner. You can have a game with no purpose. You can have a game where the rule is no rules. Let's play the dating game. Everybody loses. So with that, I see an indiscernibility. I see like the shift going on. You know, so you can't tell what's moving. Like everything's it's a game. And you recognize it as a game. Yeah. And yet you can't tell why it's a game. Now that's indiscernible. Because you're having fun? Is that why? Because <laughs> you're having fun? I don't know. There's games that aren't fun and people still play them. Yeah. Oh yeah, every board game for me. I'm the least But like, does that make sense though? I mean, Monopoly that seems players. to be like that seems to make sense to me of what they're saying. Like, yeah. what would be an indiscernible okay. concept? Um, is he talking about we can't decide what is spoken and what's written? Uh, I mean, we know what's spoken. Uh, we read it. Yeah, but, I it's mean, like you know, it's like being word, unable to like what he says: spoken signification and written signification. Yeah. Uh, it's signification. Yeah. And, you know, there's somehow an indiscernibility there. I don't see how, because yeah, obviously yeah. spoken uses the sound, the sense of sound, yeah, as opposed to the sense of sight or the sense of touch. But they use both use the sense of thought. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe something gets lost in there for them. I don't know. Uh, well, I mean, there are things that you can do in sound that you can't do with writing. But there are things you can do in writing that you cannot communicate yeah. in sound. What if you communicate sound and the words are written in the air and we just don't see it? Is that what you're I don't about? know. It's like, <laughs> like you know, like you can't speak Heideggerian, for example, because Heide no. Heidegger like does a lot of things with his writing f for effect that you can't do with spoken language. And I mean, that's genuine communication. And at the same time, it's it's a different kind of communication. It's using a sort of sort of symbols and relations which cannot be done in actual spoken language. But spoken language can do things that can't be done in written language. So I don't know. I don't. Let's move on because I don't. Right, it's not yeah. clear to me what the hell the, the, the issue is. I don't get what's indiscernible in all of this. Yeah, what's undecided. Like the, 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 the Wittgenstein examples are the only ones I can think of where the whole thing is indiscernible. Yeah. Well, like she said, uh, he doesn't just define uh, deconstruction, so. Yeah, but this is Deleuze. It's undecided uh... too. <laughs> well, they're they're talking about it in terms of Derrida. They're trying to they're talking about the strange proximity of Deleuze and Guattari with uh, Derrida. Well, let's see if Derrida. it comes. It makes because let's see if this becomes clear. Okay. Iterability implies repetition or recurrence of the same, and to the extent that a concept identifies something common to a range of particulars, conceptualization implies iterability in this sense. Frege's formal definition of concepts as functions from singular terms to truth values captures precisely this feature of concepts. By contrast, Derrida argues that iterability in this pure sense is never attained in natural language, and it is precisely in order to account for this fact that deconstructive philosophy proposes to think the concept of concept otherwise. Iterability in the straightforward sense is never attained because in reality things are never simply instantiations of a uniform concept. In this discussion of concept formation uh, in on truth and lies in an external in an extra moral sense, Nietzsche comments that quote, a word becomes a concept insofar as it simultaneously has to fit countless more or less similar cases. One leaf is always different from one from another one, so the concept leaf is formed by arbitrarily discarding these individual differences and by forgetting the distinguishing aspects. Sure thing, Leibniz. Yeah, and uh... <laughs> well, I mean, uh, by the way, like there's yeah, a famous I mean, no. bit by Leibniz called the discernibility of discernibles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bit being joke here. Okay, so uh, leaf. 
God. A leaf is. Uh, By the way, we have a concept. He a might leaf, be a- you know? he might be aping Leibniz here because Leibniz uses Probably. the exact example of a leaf. Oh, oh, did he? Okay, yeah, then he definitely is. So, <laughs> a leaf has variation, but we know what a leaf is. It's a concept, as a, as a concept, but they can be different colors. You know, they can be. But one of them has an atom that's a little funky, you know, up on the <laughs> northeast point, you know. That makes it a whole different thing. You know, okay. by, by subsuming under this false universal, you are destroying its, you're denying its individuality. Okay, so see, uh, it has evolved into something new. You see, um, uh, chocolate with almonds is not really chocolate because it's chocolate with almonds. See? But yeah, this, forms a new but concept, this chocolate, though. yeah, this with this chocolate with with almonds though is different from your chocolate with almonds. Oh, <laughs> it's got a little bit oh. more almonds than chocolate. Yeah. So basically, this is um, nominal. It's a it's nominalism. I don't get what the way they're yeah. even bothering with it. It's basically universes don't exist. It's all just individual things. You know, it's like universal just a fiction of your mind. But who cares? Uh, continuing, Derrida points out that this implies that a rigorous concept of the iterability which characterizes concept formation would not only signify repeatability of the same, but would also signify alterability of this idealized same in the singularity of the event. Derrida, what? 1988, 119. Then it would no longer have iterability. I mean, I guess you could alter it slightly and then it would I'm sorry, still be... I'm sorry, but <laughs> evolution proves you wrong on this one. Proves me wrong. Yeah, because it's or what the thing that it you know reiterizes itself, and yet in each iterization will be different, and will slowly become something utterly different. Okay, I think we're talking about two different things. Okay, but the iterability is talking about like concepts. You yeah, know, concepts are iterate, you know, or iterize, and they're individuals, yeah, they right? Have to... Well, they but, have you know, to make sense in multiple concepts contexts i mean but what about the cat that slowly turned into a squirrel over a million years <laughs> okay i mean what it, it was a cat now it's a squirrel what do you what do you say about that what do i say about it well yeah i, I mean repetition <laughs> happened well, like it, it became you know yeah. alterable in this very same singularity of the event Wait, is he arguing for or against iterability? Being Derrida, Derrida points out that this implies that a rigorous concept of the iterability, which characterizes concept formation, would not only signify repeatability of the same, but would also signify alterability of this idealized same in the singularity of the event. In other words, concepts must be supposed to involve at once repetition of the same and realization or instantiation of that same in different particulars. Yeah. Leaf is both this leaf and that leaf, as well as leafhood in general. Since leafhood is determined by the totality of particulars to which the concept applies, past and future, and since there is no possibility of measuring any particular against that ideal totality to in the present, a necessary openness of the indeterminacy affects the concept, or indeterminacy affects the concept. To the extent that the concept of iterability takes this feature of concepts into account, it becomes a complex concept that combines horizontal sameness and vertical difference. Quote, it entails the necessity of thinking at once both the rule and the event concept and singularity. Ah, uh, well, that's a shame. I okay. thought he was being more uh, radical than, than I. Th no. Hmm. I don't think he is. That goes against what I was thinking at all. No, because I think that goes. I thought he was being more radical than this. Okay. And that he was, he could, he could have been like literally drawing from evolution and saying, "Look, there is a concept <laughs> there, which literally in every iteration is slowly becoming something else, and is never self-identical from iteration to iteration. So the repetition becomes slowly, you know, something new. Yeah. There are contexts yet, or concepts yet not in existence. But if even if every leaf were to change into something else and there were no more leaves, the concept of leaf would still exist. Because uh, we would still know what it leaf... Well, like if, if anybody existed, it or something. That, yeah, yeah, said there were such things as leaves back in my day. Yeah. <laughs> it's still a concept of a leaf. I don't, I don't think that's... 
stupid to say, is it? Back in my days, our leaves were still organic. Good old Mother Nature yeah. still grew in the sunshine, but nowadays all we have is light bulbs and these plastic synthetic trees. Yeah, if no one <laughs> ate steak anymore, no one killed cows and made steak, and we had organic steak, we would still have a concept of like what a real steak was. Do you think the loose is like actually arguing that, you know, with the steak example, because we kill a cow? and turn it into steak that cow isn't a concept uh, we've de de we've hmm. certainly deterritorialized its meat <laughs> we've deconstructed the cow <laughs> into all of its parts so okay i don't know why like this paragraph is here let's see because uh, that was interesting and like uh, i kind of like it but at the same time it's like what what did this have to do with the undecidability shit the, the the horizontal sameness vertical difference thing makes sense to me. Considered as ideal objects, defined in terms of the constructive logic of iterability. Okay, why is iterability deconstructive? Uh, because it shows that they have to be repeatable in different contexts. Is it because of the openness? You know, because he says we can't know the Again. ideal totality. Uh, let's see, a bit. The, last, the second to last sentence of that prior paragraph. Since leafhood is determined by the totality of particulars to which the concept applies, that is the Deleuzean concept, past and future, and since there is no possibility of measuring any particular against that ideal totality in the present, a necessary openness or indeterminacy affects the concept. Yeah. There's no perfect leaf, so he thinks the concept of leaf fails, right? Because it has the potentiality to change or be different or something uh, or it doesn't ex yeah i guess i mean it's not that the saying concepts don't exist so much as like concepts are false yeah concepts like are you know concept of what a leaf truly is maybe or or i mean okay like his thing about ideas is like the idea would be the leaf but the leaf is nothing but the differences that it's composed of yeah like it's not the thing that orders the things it's the things that, you know, come together and form the leaf. Uh, yeah. And Every if the leaf. things change, then the leaf is gone, and the concept of the leaf is also, you know, gone. Or if the things start changing shape or color, then the concept of the leaf has changed as well. But co color is just a quality of leaf. It's part of the concept. What are you talking about? It's a difference. But it's, it's a... If I have a green a leaf and I have a red leaf, you're not going to tell me that's the same leaf. So, no, no, I didn't say that they were the same. I'm saying it's a quality of leaf. Well, yeah, but they're, it's part of it, if yeah, yeah, but it still, makes it there's no difference a different in leaf, function so. of a leaf. It makes like it a different it leaf. It still be with the same thing. I mean, if it's a one of those leaves that's crumbly when you touch it, sure, it's a totally different thing. But but no, it's a totally different. That's just leaf. the multiplicity of its uh, variables, right? Well, yeah, I, I'm not saying it's the same leaf. I'm saying. That, that's just a quality. It doesn't change the fact of it being a leaf. I mean, it's the same point that Aristotle made. But it's two different leaves. Yeah, they're two different leaves, but they're still leaves. And you know, still we're talking the about the guy here who like do, he thinks everything just changes all, all the time, okay? I'm trying to just like take well, his standpoint. Like, he's the kind of guy who will say, like, you know... What Igeros used to say, that the me two minutes from now, or rather two seconds, or two microseconds from now in the future, is no longer the me of the present. <laughs> okay, yeah. completely. It's no longer I the mean, same there, there has to be some... I, I mean, that makes quote-unquote sense. I mean, it's true, but I would say that there has to be some sort of, like, event that changes... Uh, you radically for us to say that you're a different person. Otherwise, people could just say, it wasn't me that committed that murder, it was an iteration of myself. My uh, I'm pretty sure somebody <laughs> has offered that. Oh, sure. But they didn't get away with it. Uh, it's not they, do, they do get away with it with uh, for like jury duty. <laughs> like, oh. apparently, like, I've, like, my, they had a philosophy That's department uh, philosophy at my, my uh, college. Uh, she once told me that a friend of hers, like, colleague of hers got out of jury duty by like 
saying he only believed in determinism and could not accept, you know, condemning a man, uh, you know, for being responsible for like any crime they committed because they were determined to commit it. So there was no point in, in punishing them. Oh, and but they, they literally a... like kept him from. They literally. Yeah, but they that's got him not... off the hook on that. I thought you meant they got off jury duty by saying that the me that signed up for jury duty wasn't me. I bet somebody <laughs> would do that and get away with it too. <laughs> yeah, you can you can say uh, you can get out of jury duty if you can prove that you cannot be objective about the case or whatever. Or quote unquote, you're supposed to be objective. Or you are not part of their peer group. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I'm, I'm not able to competently judge this person. So with which uh... makes you wonder, you know, does. Does that mean that if you're like a doctor and like you get sued or something, or like you know you commit a crime, can only doctors come in and like judge you in jury duty? Because I mean, I it's got to be peer a, like your that. peers. I think it just means peers in society, but yeah. Okay, what, Josh? Uh, so like, uh, A.W. You mentioned this a few minutes ago, but with the self, how we're always changing. Yeah, I I don't think it matters to talk about two milliseconds in the future or whatever but we always Unless there's a radical talk change. about like you know a decision we made in the past we could say oh i was younger and more foolish but it's still the self the concept of the self contains you know both your future and your present and your past are you saying it can only be retroactively evaluated uh sorry can you repeat that are you saying that it can only be uh, discerned from a, a position of the future, like looking back? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Otherwise, right, let's continue. Yeah, really We're almost matter. near a break, <laughs> okay. and we'll stop there. So, considered as ideal objects defined in terms of the deconstructive logic of iterability, Derridean aconceptual concepts are open multiplicities. They lack the determinacy associated with the traditional concept of concepts. I'm still not quite sure what the hell the open concept of like I mean I have some idea because of that leaf example but I still don't quite get it uh, they lack the determinacy uh, associated with the traditional concept of concepts in what is philosophy Deleuze and Watari also define concepts as open-ended and potentially variable multiplicities every concept quote is a multiplicity although not every multiplicity is conceptual Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Well, that makes uh, a lot more sense. I mean, that would that would be a difference that Hegel makes between contingent concepts and uh, you know necessary concepts. Yeah. And then necessarily contingent concepts and contingent necessary concepts. <laughs> like a clump uh, of dirt, you know, is not a concept. Like De Deleuze and Hegel would probably agree. It's like it's not a concept. You know, it's. You know, dirt it's some, concept, just something that. But... Clump is just well. Clump would be a concept because ha we have to have a conception of what constitutes a clump, as opposed to a pile or anything else. Well, yeah, I mean, and I then... have probably given Deleuze too much credit on that. Uh, I think it means <laughs> probably something far simpler and more radical. But uh... continuing, in what is philosophy Deleuze and Batory also define concepts as open-ended and potentially variable multiplicities. Every concept is a multiplicity, although not every multiplicity is conceptual. The, quote, zones of undecidability, end quote, which render concepts consistent also render them iterable in Derrida's sense of the term. Moreover, in their earlier collaborative works, they invent concepts which exhibit these formal characteristics. Like Derrida's A Conceptual Concepts, the concepts put forward in A Thousand Plateaus are not restricted by the logic of exclusive disjunction, which is supposed to govern con concept formation in the sciences in all rigorous thought. They undergo oh. continuous variation in their migration from one plateau to another. Hold on. Okay, where he says the zones of undecidability, which render concepts consistent, also render them iterable in the sense of the term. So it kind of was like limit that we were thinking, right? Yeah, that's what I, I was thinking right now. Uh, it's basically the edge of the concept is fuzzy, according to Derrida. Yeah. I mean, and Deleuze, mostly Deleuze here, according to the author. Such that... Um, to bring up a a major <laughs> one in the modern day gender, 
you know, mm. at what what fits and what doesn't fit within the concept. You know, it's fuzzy. You know, yeah. what is a woman? What is a man? Uh, a lot of people are, are battling over what is it, the dividing line, what it can be included, what it cannot be. And there's people who kind of sit back and they're like, well, you know, I think it's a fuzzy concept. doesn't really have a line. And so, you know, we could be, we could not. And so Deleuze is basically saying that uh, just like how in limit, you can't tell that the, li the limit is both of the inside and the outside, therefore cannot make a an absolute distinction between, you know, one concept and the other, such that, you know, in Hegel, uh, the something and the other concept are in truth one concept. You actually cannot define, you cannot make the whole concept without going into the other. Mm -hmm. So the limit that divides something in other is basically just, uh, you know, an in, in undecidable in that. In it's, At least that's how I'm reading it. I'm trying to, like, think about it. Is, yeah, that's what I was in Deleuze, In Deleuzean's terms, com reflecting back on Hegel. So the edge is fuzzy, you know, that's the... The edge is what, the, zone, yeah. the zone of undecidability. Yeah, things can come in and out, and you can't exactly tell why. You know, some things just feel like a game. It feels right to call it a game, and some things just don't. Some things feel right to call religion, and some things just don't. And it changes <laughs> yeah. from person to person. Uh, you know, not everybody feels that, you know, something is this or that. Even though, like, for you it might seem that way. For others, it's, it doesn't. Feels or thinks? Feels and thinks. I mean, it's like, it's like okay. God, you know. It's like some people are like... I didn't know if you were just making a point about feeling versus thought or what. No, it's the, the same thing. Right. I mean, it's like feels and same feelings thing. and things is the same thing feels for most people. Reels. Yeah, you know what they think oh, yeah. is what they feel. You know, it's like uh, having yeah. an argument with your mom about like you know what does God really mean, and then she says, "Well, you know, I don't feel your concept of God really is like you know what God should be," yeah. and uh, that's basically what zone of undecidability. You know, uh, her concept melds into yours, and yours melds into hers, but. Uh, you know, she stands on one side, you stand on the other, and like some people are like, well, you know, they're not incompatible, and some people are like, well, you know, they are incompatible, and like, they're more hard yeah. to find shit. It's kind of like that. I guess that's actually a, a particularly good example. More people are familiar with the concept of God. Yeah, and you know how, like, like how we see our concept of God as as a true concept not in conflict, the, uh, and yeah, not, not really in concept, in conflict, conflict with theirs, with the, yeah, but, theirs, they but they think wouldn't it's a accept it. Yeah, <laughs> they wouldn't accept it as such. Or the concept of communism—that's another common one. Oh yeah, that one's one that's very fuzzy because people don't agree on the concept, even within the different. Uh, uh, they don't even agree on the plane of imminence. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's no left TMZ. Uh, there's no agreement about what should be. All right. See, we're getting into the groove of things. You know, we're starting to think along Deleuzian lines. <laughs> yeah. Right? What would we that will be? all be Not dialectically, but this. what? Multiplicitly? <laughs> I mean, the, most of this is making sense to me. It's just like... Yeah. Uh, this undecidability thing like took way too long for him to explain. Yeah. So, uh, the zones of undecidability which render concepts consistent also render them iterable in Derrida's sense of the term. So they can only be repeatable because they're fuzzy. Or, you know, because right. they're limited, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because earlier, when you said you didn't understand the thing, I think I did. With the I still don't know what iterability. Iterability? Oh, has that to really do with it. I mean, oh, I know well, that's basically do? like yeah. It's another word of you know, it's an iteration. I know what iteration is. <laughs> yeah, iteration. It's, rep it's basically another form of repetition, of like according kind to kind of repetition, but like it has to fit. It's not repetition, and then it's a different thing than it is. It's that it's a, it's a like, repetition the concept of a has to thing. fit in one context and another context and other contexts. Like it can be have different iterations of itself. First, second, it's third iteration. It's kind of a repetition in that it's not it's like itself iPhones. when it's. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, you know, it's iPhone yeah, one, iPhone I, two, iPhone three. They're iterations. 
there are iterations of the iPhone. Know, there are different iterations of it. Yeah, iPhone eight or nine or ten or whatever we're on. It's not different from and, delays. It's like constant repetition. Like really. No. And I'm trying to think about the other thing. Uh, the open open multiples. Oh, the potentially variable multiplicities. If they weren't open ended then they couldn't have room for, like you said, evolution or whatever. They would be end, ends in themselves and wouldn't have anywhere to go. So uh, where are the, Where is yeah. that? Uh, it's after 1994. What is policy? 1994. The losing Watari also defined concepts as open-ended and potentially variable multiplicities. I'm pretty sure that's what you said you didn't get, right? Oh, uh, okay, yeah. No, I get that. Oh, okay. All right, let's go on. In that since they're not already preset and like they are only variable, multi they are only multiplicities already. Like they're only the concepts are constituted by the multiplicities that, that mm -hmm. constitute them. Uh, and if those change and those are changing, therefore the concept itself must be open ended. Yeah. Yeah, it's like determination and constitution and something and other, you know. Uh, uh -huh. the, yeah, the, it's open to the otherness and it has to be open to the to the otherness. Yeah. Although I'm sure there are far more fit concepts in the logic that uh, closer <laughs> come to uh, this consideration. Um, da -da -da -da. Like Derrida is a conceptual concept, the concepts put forward in 8,000 plateaus are not restricted by the logic of exclusive disjunction, which is supposed to govern con concept formation in the sciences and all rigorous thought. Um, exclusive disjunction is just a, a very high fancy way of saying they're different and they can only be different. Mm -hmm. and, and disconnected. You know, and they're exclusively, yeah, dis incompatible and disconnected. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, whereas here Derrida says, and Derrida and uh, uh, Deleuze are obviously uh, contextual. Ba they basically believe that concepts are context, really, you know, yeah. and therefore the context changes, the concept must change it too. Uh, which obviously, I don't disagree. I mean, it's... Yeah, it has to. Otherwise, you got an empty concept. Except on logical grounds, the context is different, you know. The, Hegel keeps it to logical context as opposed to this mix of logical and empirical, which is mostly empirical. Like, the, most of their examples are empirical ones and can only make sense empirically, which is kind of uh, being sleazy. Like, yeah, it's being yeah. sleazy about what concept is. <laughs> well, they care about what they care about, I guess. So right, uh, I don't think they're doing it on purpose to be dishonest or anything. No, no, it's just I'm saying, like you know, they're saying it in a yeah. certain way, which I think is counter to what most of us will consider concepts. Yeah. So, anyways, they undergo continuous variation in their migration from one plateau to another. I wish I could jump fucking plateaus. <laughs> I'd be like some like super Mongolian, you know, have that little Mongolian horse and like hat. <laughs> What? You know, Mongolians live on the something? plateaus. Oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't know if you were referencing something, though. You could do the... Yeah, let's rope say, singing. I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure, like, uh, Genghis Khan, you know, could jump from plateau to plateau. Okay. If Adam could live 9,000 years, Genghis Khan could jump plateaus. What? Oh, yeah. Adam? The first man? Yeah. yeah. So according to the Bible, he lived like 9,000 yeah. years or something. Yeah, I know. But what is How that? could he live 9,000 <laughs> years if the Earth is only 6,000 years old? I don't know, man. The, the, the time be. between Eden and then, like, you know, afterwards, who knows? Or, you, or do you think, was... like, you think it literally happened, like, over a weekend that, you know, it's like God made them and they're like, oh shit. <laughs> they said it's like he... let's fuck things up. 
The Bible said that he walked the earth for 9,000 years. I don't know. He I'm lived, just, uh, uh, he lived for a long time, let's just say. Like, yeah, yeah, but I thought, I, I know there was, was it, like this new thing, but I thought it was that like we found out that he was 9,000 years younger than we previously thought, not that he lived that long. I don't know. Okay. All I know is like, look, Noah <laughs> and Abraham. No Noah lived like nine hundred so. years, and like yeah. Abraham lived yeah, like six hundred. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he had a child at eighty or something. Yeah. All and right, his wife go. is literally the only woman to like literally laugh at God in his face. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, uh, against the arborescent image. Uh, tree-like image, which has been prevalent, prevalent in the history of philosophy. They propose a rhizomatic image of thought in which concepts are never stable but in a state of constant flux as they are modified or transformed in the passage from one problem to the next. So, okay. okay. I still don't know what rhizome is. Uh, just think horizontal as opposed to vertical. Uh, I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, I've heard like it's a mathematical transfer. concept. I have no idea. So, hey, you can find out after this and like let us know up here. I mean, I can look it up right now if you want. So they propose a rhizomatic image of thought in which concepts are never stable, but in a state of constant flux as they are modified or transformed in the passage from one problem to the next. The novelty of this conception of thought does not lie in its refusal of any systematic character, but rather in the nature of the system which it develops. Haha, <laughs> I know Ego Waffles would uh, completely disagree with this. Like he's one of those people who reads uh, Deleuze is complete and utterly anti-systematic. Oh. Which, I mean, I think Deleuze like, doesn't try to be. He thinks he is, but uh, I don't think one can be. Like, if difference is fundamental to, like, the way he literally thinks his logic, then everything can be systematized according to that logic. Sure. So, uh, the novelty of this conception of thought does not lie... Uh, sorry. That is why when Deleuze describes himself as a philosopher in a very classical sense who believes in philosophy as a system, he immediately qualifies this comment by pointing out that he envisages, envisages a system in perpetual heterogeneity. So a system that is in perpetual self-difference. Yeah. It is in Deleuze's early write earlier writings that the requirements of such a conceptual heterogeneous heterogenesis are worked out in explicit engagement with the philosophical tradition. From his essay on Proust, through What is Philosophy?, Deleuze has pursued the question of the nature of thought. What is at stake in this question is the effort to describe and exercise an exercise of thought, which is, quote, opposed to the traditional image which philosophy has projected or erected in thought in order to subjugate it and prevent it from functioning, end quote. Deleuze in Parnay, 1987. Chapter 3 What's of Difference so and Repetition. What's Chapter 3 mean? of Difference. Yeah. Well, never mind Proust. <laughs> you can find out later since, like... Your yeah. literature I'm guy. just wondering why they dropped that, you know, and just didn't even talk about it. Because really. it's from his essay on Proust all the look, way. Deleuze was cultured as well. <laughs> well, no, it's like where it's, it's the, from that essay to the end, yeah. that issue yeah. gets forth. So. Makes okay. sense. Yeah. Chapter 3 of Difference and Repetition provides the most developed analysis of the dominant image of thought and his own alternative conception. In his retrospective comments on this book, Deleuze repeatedly singles out this chapter as the most important with respect to his subsequent practice of philosophy, describing it as the most necessary and the most concrete, and as the one which serves to introduce subsequent books up to and including the research undertaken with Guattari, where we invoked a vegetal model of thought, the rhizome in opposition to the tree. Oh, okay, so it's not a mathematical. Wait. Wait, how so is right, it in opposition to the tree? Because the tree looks one... It's an image of thought, man. The rhizome looks a certain way. The tree looks a certain yeah. way. So let me look up what the hell a rhizome looks like. You know, maybe I should put that for the image of the video. Yeah.
looks to me like a jumble of interconnected stuff. Just a bunch of root type things. Yeah. So the tree is uh, what comes out of the roots at the top, but a rhizome rises out of the top like roots and spreads out a bunch of different places. Is that what it means? Yeah, I think um, so. Okay. I'm also <laughs> seeing an image of a, like a rhizome connecting like various things. So the rhizome is like basically grows horizontally just as a uh, Chaya was saying. Yeah. And it, it sprouts many different plants. Yeah. I'm seeing a rhizome as a picture of a piano piece for David Tudor. <laughs> which is interesting. Kind of looks like uh, uh, Shanakis's stuff. Well, oh, Almighty Wikipedia, tell me what a rhizome is according to What's less scientist man. Uh, rhizome, a continuously growing horizontal underground stem that puts out lateral shoots and adventitious roots at intervals. Okay. So, not that complex. I thought it was some mass term. And... Well, okay, never mind. It's complex in that, you know. It's a bunch of interconnected shit. It's literally anarchic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, you think it's anarchic? Well, it's got no hierarchy. It just goes horizontally. just oh, spreads well, more yeah, and yeah. more and it's like sprouts more and more things. Mm -hmm. All right. I thought you meant it was just chaotic and had no structure. <laughs> that too. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, they have structures, obviously. It's just... Yeah. All right, you need me. All right, use that picture I linked. It's cool. So, all right, so continuing. In the introduction to difference and repetition, Deleuze explains the theatrical forms of thought common to Nietzsche and Kierkegaard by reference to their shared interests in movement, not in the sense that they wrote about motion, but in the sense that they want to put metaphysics in motion. His own adoption of a method of dramatization, dramatization is evidence that he too shared this interest in a thought which moves, However, as he comments in an interview, it is not enough simply to say that concepts possess movement. You also have to construct intellectually mobile concepts. A Thousand Plateaus is the realization of this goal. It does more than simply record the movement to which concepts are subject in the course of the history of philosophy. It creates concepts that are defined by their relations to the outside and hence their capacities for movement and transformation. Only in this way is it possible to map, rather than trace, the variability inherent in all rhizomatic assemblages. Okay, I don't get the uh, visual image of the difference between mapping and tracing. Uh, mapping and tracing? Yeah, I mean, so uh, it all, mapping all is like this. points, right? And then tracing would be connecting them. Only in this way is it possible to map rather than trace the variability inherent in all rhizomatic assemblages. No idea. To trace would be to connect or like write around it or whatever. Map would be to either look at and notify that that's where it is or like put a place. I don't know. Uh, yeah. The anexactitude of mobile concepts so, is unavoidable. I don't know what that word is. Non-exactness, basically, I guess. Oh, an exactitude. exactitude. Yeah, uh, an exactitude. So against exactness. I don't think it's a real word, but yeah. I yeah. Do. He could have used inexact. Fucking yeah, asshole. inexact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he's French. He has to use an exactitude. 
I mean, I don't know if that's a French word, but you know, it has to be complex. It must be Derrida does like whole things. Like you know, oh, we gotta use words that people don't recognize. You know, to deterritorialize their minds. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it helped, I guess. No, it doesn't. <laughs> It just takes time, I guess. It, it's an unnecessary waste of time. Well, saying. they look profound when they come yeah. up with these new terms. Uh, yeah. An ex- an exactitude. <laughs> like, it literally is, it just reeks of elitism to me. Like, seriously. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. I, I, he- it, like, but, like yeah. Hegel doesn't feel this way. Like, Hegel's, yeah. Hegel at first, like, seems to, like, make no sense because, one, it's words that we're not used to, that they're a- they're not part of our common language anymore but they were and then, then also it's just it's common sense words used slightly differently and yet yeah. they are completely connected to their common sense meaning mm-hmm. so anyways uh, the in the anexactitude of mobile concepts is unavoidable to losing what Tori suggests an exactitude is in no way an approximation. On the contrary, it is the precise movement of that which is underway. End quote. <laughs> cool. So it's an exact in that it's not yet exact, but it's moving towards exactness. And it knows what it's going towards. Well, uh, I don't know if you would say that, because that already pauses a well, teleology, which I think he denies. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. But he says... Uh, it's in no way an approximation, because if you say it's inexact, then, well, you're just approximating. You don't know what you're doing. It's not exact. You know, but then it would exact, be a precise, precise movement. movement of that, which is... A, so the inexact, the okay, inexactness so is where exactly going, what it is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, we yammered on for long enough on this. And this, uh, these chapters are long. I mean, it's uh, about 170 page about 170 pages uh, and there's only six chapters so we made it 27 pages in so far mm-hmm. we're making progress all right so uh, we'll leave it there next time we will start on on the dogmatic, the dogmatic image, of image of thought uh i don't know man it seems to me he's pretty dogmatic <laughs> well, we can see <laughs> next time. I want to read his Proust and Signs now. Oh, uh, I looked it up, by the way. Uh, the French word is inexactitude, so it's probably just a bad translation. Yeah, fucking translator. <laughs> anyways, uh, any thoughts on on what we read? Our brains awake enough? I mean, yeah. Part of me does see how Deleuze has influenced the uh, the contemporary left quite a bit on certain ways. Like, I definitely see how he can be uh, blamed for idpol, um, or blamed for this kind of like, you know, oh, I'll just say it, the feels over reels kind of thing. Like, I, I, I don't know, like, from from what I can tell from this, it does seem kind of like that. Like, oh, I just feel this, and that's my politics. And Yeah, there's a, yep. an aesthetic, uh, a necessary aesthetic dimension to what he, he thinks, and he's proud of that. Uh, uh, he will, like, that's what makes him an empiricist, you know, his experience. Not, uh, yeah. not feeling experience precisely, but, I mean, he, he privileges experience in some way. But, I mean, it's not entirely a bad thing. It's just like when you're, you know, you, your whole political program, if you are talking about politics, if it just comes down to like, okay, this is what I feel. I mean, you can't just go off on this kind of like the lipsism, I guess. I, but that that just comes from, I guess, my whole uh, time. Logic. Of a, yeah. <laughs> no, no. But just like yeah. my whole time, like, you know, being a political activist and just seeing like how you know movements fizzle out and everyone is just kind of clashing with each other and shit and you know it's... Yeah. but do we think he can be salvaged that's the thing mm. i'm seeing th- no oh. <laughs> but there's n- like i'm not I- yeah. Yeah. 
I'm just. Yep, I'm not disagreeing with as much as I thought I would, but I didn't go into it, like, looking to disagree, so that's good. Yeah, no, I'm not looking to disagree with him, I just, like, if it I'm makes sense, it makes to, sense. Yeah, I'm actually looking to see if it coalesces with uh, what I, like, think I know, <laughs> or whatever about Hegel, you know? Is this synthesis possible? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well... I mean, it's like it butchers both of them, but yeah, it would, yeah, it would be irreconcilable yeah. to keep them uh, as they are. It'd be a shitty Frankenstein. I mean, there's a there's an essay literally about uh, Hegel and Deleuze that I was I opened up yesterday and I forgot to read it, and I gotta find it again. It's basically like Deleuze and Hegel together at last for like it had a weird like you know one of those like. Titles that are just weird. Together for the first, together at last, f for like the first time or something. I don't need. I don't fucking know. It was weird. <laughs> Apparently, somebody's like, "You hey, look, they're not that different." In which case, you know, I would actually say it. It it'd be. It's really hard, like really, really hard, to be different from Hegel, like fundamentally. <laughs> yeah. Because Hegel just like covers so much. Like, almost anything you got to say, like, Hegel says, yeah, you know, I, it's good, but, you know, you're missing something. <laughs> yeah, that, that's pretty much it. So, anyways, we'll leave it there. We've been gone for two hours. Uh, that was a pretty long reading session, but... Uh, oh, it was a good talk. I learned, uh, it was a good talk. Uh, I learned some things. Uh, as, as much as, like, the confusion went on, it wasn't for too long, uh, so far, the writing is not too bad in this book. Uh, let's hope it stays that way. All right. See you Goodbye. people next time. <laughs>